This is Dick Whitney, and it's February 2012. I had made up a um, DVD of my father's home movies of the 1960s because I thought people would enjoy seeing them. And I had it all prepared with music and then decided a story that Rich Dugas uh, had written for my website several years ago on the class of 66 and his recollections would go well with this. I also decided to include a little of my recollections of Litchfield Ave since at the beginning of this production uh, there are a lot of Litchfield Ave pictures so movies that is so that's what we have now and I'm trying to put this together in an order that makes sense so hopefully you will enjoy the audio and the movies uh, Whitney Home movies of the 1960s well I'd like to thank Rich Dugas again for his great uh, recollections of the so many uh, events and names of Southbridge I'm not that good at remembering names but uh, Dad had written something in 98, Don Whitney, which uh, I'd like to read a, a segment of because it leads into my recollections of Litchfield Ave. When they first came to town in 1947, uh, June of 1947, Dad worked at American Optical Company uh, in the R&D lens design area, and they had a couple apartments, first in Spencer and then in Southbridge. Houses and apartments were hard to find. But this is what he wrote in 98 about the Litchfield Ave House. By this time, we had several real estate agents searching for us, and one of them was Mrs. Perkins. Came up with a house on Litchfield Ave, which just seemed right. Just right, that is, except for the price. The owner was asking 14500 and I was earning 2600 a year. It couldn't be done. The owner then came down to 12500 It still couldn't be done. Then the owner dropped to ten five, but without some of the land. We would pay ten five, but when the land, the owner accepted. So back to my recollections. Dad taught me the love of photography, and due to this, I have been able to share many memorables of Selfridge photos since the late 1940s. As I have scanned and preserved these photos on Litchfield Ave and the general Selfridge in general, I have reflected on how fortunate I was, and still am, to live in such a wonderful area. And I am proud to call Selfridge my home. Assuming one was fortunate to grow up and live in the household that was loving and nurturing, early neighborhood memories are almost certainly going to look be upon look be upon fondly as the years pass. In my case, this is true, and I expect that those uh, listening to this will have similar memories. Perhaps uh, listening will trigger such memories, and I welcome uh, them. Just send to dickwhitney.net. Uh, anyway, because of the photos taken, some of my memories are brought and added to light. Uh, turning to the topic of growing up in Litchfield Ave, I was fortunate to be on a dead-end portion of the street and have a large backyard where I could play ball, badminton, croquet, practice archery, and eat a f even photograph the nighttime sky as I grew older before I became interested in astronomy. Some of my oldest and earliest recollections of the neighborhood relate to events such as the 1955 flood. I was four years old at the time and can recall looking back at uh, looked through the kitchen window and seeing our entire backyard was underwater. This flooding in our yard was not the result of dams bursting, as had occurred at West Street in the Flats area. Litchfield Ave is significantly higher in elevation than those in the other parts of town. It was just that the ground was saturated uh, from the heavy rains, and I was impressed with the water that I saw. I became close friends with several boys and girls in the neighborhood. My oldest and closest friend was Jeff McKinstry. We shared many experiences growing up in the neighborhood. Jeff lived around the corner at 58 Poplar Street, which was within earshot when Mum used to signal that time, playtime was up and it was time to come home for, for dinner. She would ring the cowbell, which I heard loud and clear usually. Jeff and I played for hours in the backyard and in the woods. Since we both were shy, our bond grew and our early memory, uh, one early memory of, that I have of Jeff was crying when his mother Esther left who I called Annie Esther, left him off at West Street School for the first time. I felt like crying as well, but I don't believe I did because I was too intent on watching Jeff. The McKinstries and the Whitneys have shared a unique, unique family relationship, as both Sue's family and mine have and remain close with their offspring to this day. When Jeff passed away of a sudden heart attack on May 16, 2001, I gave the following. On May 16th, I lost my best friend since childhood. We both grew up in the same neighborhood, and the Whitney McKinstry family has fostered many close friendships. 
through each succeeding generation. Jeff and I were inseparable since our preschool days and best friends as long as I can remember. I knew his phone number before I memorized mine. When I think of Jeff, I think of many things. Mrs. Mundell's kindergarten class at Trinity Church. First day at West Street, we walked home every lunch. Cub Scout Pack 135 and Elm Street Church Fellowship Hall. The YMCA Dem summer day camp over in Charlton. Playing in the silo at its cousin farm in Charlton. West Street, uh, I mean Wells Junior High, recess in the middle courtyard, which was accessed through the windows. SHS class of 69 experiences and our graduation. The many games we played from golf over at Nichols Golf Course to badminton, chef, uh, chess, archery, etc. He was best man at my wedding. I photographed his wedding. The births of our children, Corey, Alyssa, Chris, and Erica. His wife, Joanne, babysat for our kids. Jeff will sorely be missed. Other boys that I played with in the neighborhood, including Steve Matus, Paul Turpos, Don Barr, Stephen, Neil Tiberi, Ed Brunel, Dennis Wright, and Bobby Haynes. Sue and I became also very close to Leslie Martel, Sarah Haynes, and Diana Rossman, who lived in the, all lived in the neighborhood. The Haynes's moved into the Oella's house in the late 1950s. That's where Joe Funcaster lives next to a, uh, our house on 122 Litchfield. They lived there uh, the Haineses until 1962 when Bob moved. Our families were close. Bob and, and Dad worked on, at AO and knew each other since 1947, but were also ham radio operators and enjoyed contacting one another even when they lived next door. I'm reminded of one time Dad commented on ham radio to one of his contacts that he had to sign off as he had a dinner engagement with neighbors, something he really didn't want to, to go to. When Bob opened the door to his house, he said, so I understand you don't want to eat here tonight. That was one of life's embarrassing moments. I was fortunate to have been able to walk to and from school from first grade to high school. When I went to grade school, West Street was a neighborhood school and grades one through five from our neighborhood were housed there. Charlton Street and Eastford Road were also neighborhood grade schools. I can recall really enjoying my walk to and from when the spring weather was nice. I also arrived those West, uh, remember the West Street school years and I was allowed to walk home for lunch. I had great outdoor fun in the summer and winter on Litchfield Ave. I recall bringing my, uh, buckling my boots that snapped with metal buckles, although they froze with ice and snow when we were used. So I would play for hours in the snow. We had great fun. One year the snow crusted such that we were able to sled on the hardened snow. I remember sledding next door to Leslie Martell's house near the end of our street and thinking how great it was. I had a Snow Devil uni sled, which I think you saw in the movie, that Dad had given me, and I remember that that was the best winter fun I ever had. That was something, since we had great fun building igloos also with our friends. I even remember shoveling the backyard and making snow trails. What follows is a reading of a recollection submitted to me by Rich Dugas a few years ago, and it's titled, I Remember the 1960s by Rich Dugas, South Beach High, Class of 1966. Hello there, Southbridge. When Dick Whitney asked me to write something for his website, I thought I could bring back memories from the 1960s for Southbridge readers and those living across the country who follow his popular website. I'm going to mention a lot of names that folks will recognize and relay some anecdotes that stand out for me from that turbulent decade. Attending Wells Junior High's 8th grade class of 1961 was quite a change from the seven years of Catholic grammar school at E. Cole, Notre Dame on Pine Street. The public schools were a relief though after being with the nuns for seven years in the 1950s and studying religion so intensely. Junior high teachers, I remember, uh, were Mrs. Sweet, my English teacher, and Mr. Winheim, both excellent educators, and Vice Principal Joseph C. Montigny. I also remember Cow Cesolini, Chet Sigonowitz, Petey Batista, Roger Sinney, Pudgy Plant, Julie Sheswinpin, Kenny Lacoste, all who were in my class, and of course the accelerated class, he he, kids Bucky Howard, Jane Clark, Mike Busquet, Margaret Basari, Natalie Gubb, Thomas Christo, and others would march down the hall, uh, and we would snicker as the smart kids had their own advanced classes. Of course, many of us in the dumb class had been to Catholic grammar school and were already advanced, but had no public school records, so were placed in the other class. By the sixth grade, I had already read in French and English, 
complete with book reports written in French, all of Hugo and Dumas, classics, following a Parisian French course of study practiced by the Sisters of Notre Dame. Another eighth grade moment happened when our basketball team traveled to Marianapolis Academy in Connecticut for an afternoon game. Caio Cesolini was our star. I often wondered how great a football player Caio would have been if he hadn't moved to Midwest High School from South Beach High. So we were a pretty good team, but everyone we tried, wherever we tried, was whistled for a foul. I mean everything. Well, our coach Dick Ledoux had finally seen enough, and he said, Okay, boys, you're out of here. We grabbed our stuff and marched out of the gym behind Mr. Ledoux in the third quarter, got on a bus and left. So much for sportsmanship. I loved it. We were not going to take that standing up. I think I would have done the same thing, officiating was so lopsided. It was also at this time in the eighth grade I first met Fitzy, John Fitzgerald. At recess, we would stare at each other in the backyard. I was six feet tall and had always been the tallest class. Not anymore. Fitzy was six foot two and a lot bigger than me. We kept a good distance from each other. Everyone gave Fitzy a wide berth. He was not a bully, just a very large presence in the eighth grade. Things got a lot better in the ninth grade at South Beach High. I see what they called freshmen. Immediately, I had several crutches simultaneously. Penny Collette, Sue Bastian, Sue Shawaka, to name a few upperclassmen, and several teachers, too. Freshmen were ignored back then, except for big kids. Football coach Don Marino had his eye on the eighth grade, and he was ready to pounce. He got us big guys to go out for football, and I was told by Coach Marino, Don't quit, Dugas. I actually think I would have had he hadn't said that. He had a way to motivate young men. It wasn't the fear of God anymore. Now it was the fear of Mingo. I made the team. Actually, everyone who didn't quit made the team. Everyone who didn't mind eating dirt and getting their butts kicked. I remember having a knack for tackling from the beginning. We were put on the field to defend the first team offense. Like I said, we got our butts kicked. But from the defensive end position, I'd rush in and tackle Bruce Giovanello every time there was a screen pass on my side. No one blocked me, and I'm not sure I was supposed to tackle him, but I did anyway and didn't get chewed out. Bruce never complained, either. He was a star runner, and in retrospect, I think he was supposed, I was supposed to let him go. I remember standing next to Mr. Winheim, the SHS, SHS track coach in the ninth grade, 1963, and watching Bruce set, out, set the South Beach High School record with a 10-flat, 100-yard dash, and he played football, too. Mingle didn't protect anyone, except for Billy Busso, who had sprained ankles, and when Coach Marino turned Fitzy into a 300-pound fullback in 64, gaining notoriety across the state, Mingo took Fitzy off defense. Of course, Big John went on to Boston College and then had a stellar career as a center for the Dallas Cowboys. His number 62, forever enshrined in the historic NFL f films as the man who protected the Cowboys' great um, a quarterback, Roger Staubach, and Fitzy made every film clip from that era. Years and even decades later, you would see him in the replays of the Cowboys game in the 1970s. I can't remember how many times I said, look, there's Fitzy, when watching the pro football game on Sunday. Myself and many athletes of our time had watched every pro football championship game since 1958, and I still hadn't missed one. Sophomore year brought new challenges. The school I was looking for a good laugh at the time and plenty of girl watching too. Very funny guys like Ron Simonelli, Tom Zotos, Ray Madour, Mutt Morrow, and Chris Valpini kept me laughing throughout the day. Fitzy and Rudy made the starring football team. I played varsity special teams, but second team offense and defense providing a big body for the first team to knock around. Important job though to keep the first team offense and defense sharp. The football tradition of SHS was the best around, and we won more games than any other team in Central Mass. I started that year with an awesome JV basketball team and played some varsity too. All those years playing pickup and summer basketball at Dresser Street Field, my home away from home, with the likes of Dick Stewart, Chucky Wright, Paul Manny, uh, Ronnie Wayne, Jerry Henault, Mike Bousquet, Bob Desenia, Desanya, Rob Ralph Lacanto, Pete Janzek, Paul Hapgood, Phil and Pete Kunoya, and Nellie Carpenter, and many others were paying off. And we clicked as a team, I think, 
we were the 22nd and one for Don Bernard and our JV coach. The varsity also did well that year with Donnie Farron, Fulvio Gentili, Paul Manny, Tom Borghese, Jimmy Kane, and the amazing Billy Kerboy, Jimmy Damian, Scotty Phipps, Timmy Hughes, Justin DuPaul, and Steve Zoto. Across town, the Notre Dame high school team was really making noise. I think we split with them, but they beat us just everybody for three years running. For school with maybe 50 boys that played like God was coaching them. Another of their players was Chucky Wright, Pete Janzek, Henry Hank Bishop, Skip Pelletier, Leo Ferrand, Russ Lesneski, and Len Lazur. The magic of Notre Dame Hall, with its undersized basketball court providing at Notre Dame a long winning streak there. I love that court too, once canning eight jumps in a row from the wing in a losing effort at Notre Dame Hall. The best high school player I ever saw there was, not, was Dame Boomba, Dave Boomba, who canned 56 points before the three shot in a losing effort against Notre Dame. A new year and a new crop of cheerleaders to flirt with, including Celine Poirier, Ruth Krasnoff, Donna Palmerino, Charlene Boudelet, Diane Supernaut, Donna Magoon, Ann Palmerino, Susan Aslan, Masha Domjin. Our first managerettes were Cheryl Rodeo, Sue Whitney, Starbath, Diana Rossman, Trina D'Angelo, Dee Dee Allard, Jeannie Dubriel, and Louise Sandman. Our baseball players were Jack Litchfield, Stan Zula, Ronnie Zumalis, <clears throat> Bob Vizania, Jimmy Joet, Ray Tra Trahan, Ted Mack, Billy D'Angelo, DiGregorio, Dave Laflame, Kim Pomerino, and Pete Gaudet, with myself and Spider Cronin <clears throat> competing for the last position so vigorously that our manager, Bob Young, kept us both as on the team. I remember doing wind sprints and laps with Spider on my side every step of the way. Football and then ba basketball were bigger, but we played baseball too, despite no one coming to watch the games. The YMCA downtown was a great place to hang out after school, playing ping pong and handball with the likes of Arthur Gerard, Steve Pompreon, Franny Lippi, Ronnie Juvenello, Ray Madour, and Len Nicoletti. Heated and competitive table tennis matches lasting up to an hour and lifting weights was a big part of our time at the old Y in the building at the corner of Main and Elm Streets. Other weightlifters, weightlifters including Ronnie, Ronnie O'Hop, Louise Demby, Bob DeSanier, and John Fitzgerald. I remember the Elm Cafe was an awesome place to hang out, play pitch, and drink beer. Marathon full deck pitch matches for money against those house champs Pudgy Plant and Alan Damaris. Everyone knew they had signals, but we beat them many times anyway. Mutt Morrow, Len Nicoletti, Ray Madour, Putzen Pluff, Bill Brackett, Bar Kiefer's Corfe Pluff, and Rudy Sabatinelli, buddies from work at the Classy Country Club, Chauncey Phipps, Dane Damien, Jerry Henault, and many others would stop in for some sports talk and beer. I remember, quote, parking at the bridge near the Westville Dam, a public road where no cars would be seen all night. I remember parking at the Dudley Sand Pits with my best girlfriend, Nancy Gellinu, along with Roger Sinney and Matt Mal Gorski, with Roger's portable record player spinning stones and Beatles songs on the back windowsill. I remember the rat dances at the town hall with Mickey and the Motion sounding just like the Beatles. Mickey McDonald, who had been my classmate at E. Cole Notre Dame since kindergarten, was the best singer around. Mickey was scheduled to reprise those great Friday nights at Selfridge Town Hall at our 25th reunion in 1991, but he passed away at the young age of 43 a few weeks before the reunion. I remember celebrating the Selfridge sesquicentennial with Randy Morse, Lucy, Lucille Blaze, Bucky Howard and Ray Madour, with Bucky's father, Ken Howard, living in the cave under Denison Rock to recreate the life of the first white settler in Southbridge, James Denison. See pictures uh, some, somewhere else on Dick's website. Only six years, six more years until the Southbridge Bicentennial and the 50th anniversary class of 66 in 2016. I remember playing in the fast pitch softball league at Henry Street Field and playing against the King and his court at Dresser Field in July or August of 69. 
on the same diamond that I played Little League game 10 years before. And this was sandwiched between Woodstock and the moon landing. Interesting that Al Jackson, the King's regular first baseman, and I worked alongside the other for years in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, himself as a coach at St. Raphael Academy, and myself as a photographer at the Pawtucket Times newspaper. Jackson, who hit 1,014 home runs in a 22-year career with the King, still plays at age 77 in a senior softball league in Winsocket, Rhode Island. I remember skating Carpenter's Pond behind Henry Street Field, documented elsewhere on this site, to Buddy Holly and Richie Valens, blaring over the loudspeaker, the day the music died, February 3rd, 1959. I remember clearly November 22nd, 1963, when Mrs. Cassavan and other teachers were hysterical when the news of President Kennedy's death became known. I remember hoping the football practice was canceled that fateful day. It wasn't. I remember clearly the wor worried look on Mr. Varon's face 13 months earlier in October 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I remember clearly the week in 1965, SHS students boycotted the cafeteria and made the newspapers and made the lunch ladies cry. Coach Marino made the football team march into the cafeteria and buy lunch to set an example for the school after a few days of everyone bringing their lunch instead of buying it. I remember hating that, and I also hated when Mingo made the football team march into the sports writer's Ray Hebert's mother's wake at Memorial's funeral home wearing our undefeated jackets. Presumably, I recall, to show respect after all of the 1964 team's publicity in the newspaper, or was it a publicity stunt? I definitely felt like a pawn in a chess match those days. But worst of all for me was the Monday football practice after the late October 1965 gain against Northbridge that we lost to spoil our chances at 19 wins in a row. Coach Marino made us scrimmage Tantasqua full contact for two hours on a day of rest normally. I think he wanted to match head coach Paul Duhart's run of 27 straight wins in the late 1950s and was punishing us for losing. I remember even the coaches were avoiding him. He was so upset. Only Chet Siganowitz was smart enough to avoid practice that day by leaving school early with diarrhea. Coach Marino, upon hearing Chet's excuse the next day, screamed, Diarrhea! S-H! Exclamation point. Tantasqua power runner Al Demby ran my side repeatedly that day, and I had to drag Al to the ground after he ran over me on several plays. Monday was not supposed to be a full contact day. Starting football players, especially both way players, needed two days off after a Saturday game just to recuperate from the full body aches and pains you would have the next day after the game. But high school football builds character, and we survived and became better because of it. Coach Marino and staff were top-notch as teachers and coaches and very good at getting scholarships for the best players. The coaches would shop game films around to football schools with a lot of success. Coach Marino helped kids get jobs, too. I remember my final high school football game on Bartlett on Thanksgiving Day, 1965. The SHS defense, nicknamed the Chain Gang, held Bartlett scoreless, and we beat them 14-0 to finish a two-year record of 18-1. and I made several tackles all over the field, chasing down Bartlett RB Paul Deary and tackling him many times. Deary had shot off his mouth about beating us, and they didn't score a point. I also intercepted a screen pass but got lead foot and was tackled from behind by Patler quarterback Tony Tommaso before I reached the end zone. The chain gang allowed very few points in two years except at Northbridge where we gave up 26. One of the most impressive sights during the football season was our exit from the locker room just before home game. We would growl and bark like angry pit bulls and we rushed through the doors at top speed and sprinted onto the field. A strategy not only to fire us up but scare the wits out of the opponent. Fans would gather near the locker room for the experience. Just before our big matchup against Athol in 65, we were ranked 1 and 2 in Central Mass. I remember Coach Marino smashing a chair into pieces and screaming, Now get out there and kick some butt. And 25 guys bolted upright in full pads and ran for a door 30 inches wide. I was so surprised we didn't burst right through the cement wall. We dominated 30 and 0 with our touchdown twins, Rudy Sabatinelli and Billy Brusso running left, right, and center all afternoon, which of course set up our down game against Northbridge the following week. The team was so hell-bent on beating us, they sent spies to document our plays during the weeks before the game, 
and were well prepared for our matchup. I remember Mingo screaming at Dresser Field Superintendent Arthur Giroux, Arthur, get those scouts away from the fence. They wouldn't dare come inside the field. The game could have been worse. I remember the goal line stand near the late October 1965 debacle when Bob DeSalia and myself stood up two blockers and stopped their running back and the one foot line for four straight downs. It must have been those extra monkey line, m monkey rolls line coach Tony Santilli made us do the week before the practice that helped us, but Northbridge was too prepared and fired up for us that day. From what I understand, this rivalry continues today. Southbridge, with its head coach, Frank Kumanellis, who was a Southbridge High School player in my day, and Northbridge head coach, Ken LaChapelle, who was the captain of the quarterback of the NHS 65 team that beat us 26 to 12. Two heroic actions that I remember from my senior year in football. Rudy Sabatinelli played with a broken jaw in 1965. His jaw was wired shut. Everything he ate was through a straw. And John Fitzgerald playing in the Bartlett game after the death of his father the day before the game. I also remember the following year playing across the line from my high school pal and teammate Jimmy Tiberi, who, as pulling offensive guard at Southern Con, was assigned to trap block me when I was 280 pound defensive tackle playing American International in Springfield. I remember following that incredible Red Sox impossible dream season in the fall of 67, celebrating until the end with friends and New England's own Narragansett Lager beer. As Col Ken Coleman used to say, hi neighbor, have a Gansett. Sure enough, we would support the old town team by drinking plenty of Gansetts and sending dimes to the Jimmy Fund. That magical season might have ended the curse if not for the beaning of Tony Conigliero that summer when Angels pitcher Jack Hamilton threw a wildly wildly and hit Tony C in the face, ending his season and damaging his career. His teammates would later say that not enough warm-up pitches after the delay due to the smoke bomb contributed to Hamilton's wild pitch. This near-fatal beaning led to a major change in the decision of the batting helmet to include in a large ear flap. Koenig was a young player uh, ever in the, was the youngest player ever in the American League to reach 100 homes and the most home runs, 25, as a teenager in Major League Baseball. This Boston native was filling the seats at Fenway Park, too. The Red Sox in the 60s were not just about Yaz, Jim Lomberg, and Rico Petroselic. Tony Caliguerrero was building a building superstar, and Dick Williams was a great manager. When the 60s were history, our college deferments ran out, and young men across the country were included in a national draft lottery that took place in 1971. 306 little balls with days of the year printed on them were drawn on national TV. Draft-aged men from the first 106 